We are back at the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center, and this time I'm here with Ben Connolly. Hello. Yes, hello. Whom I've known for what nearly four years now, and yeah, yeah. And actually, I didn't tell you this, and I don't know if you remember this, but mm. the very first time I came here and attended the Sunday Intro to Meditation, mm. you were the very first person in the very first oh. class. So you could say that in a way you taught me the meditation. Mm. And you, you were the one at that time who showed how simple it was. And actually, I, I, I kept, I still remember how that day, when, you know, I was biking away from here. I kept thinking, this cannot be it. This is not right. There's got to be more <laughs> to it. You know, I, I just kept thinking, you know, <laughs> you know, these people are hiding something from us. You know, but there's got to be something to it. So, but, you know, later I realized that that's pretty much it. And that's what makes it really, really hard. Right, to, to yeah, to, to engage in life just completely, moment to moment, seems like it would be simple, but it's, it's hard to do. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 you know, when we do something, there seems to be, it's, it's a whole lot of range when you do something. You know, you can do something kind of slower, then more active, more active, and you think, okay, well, when you don't do anything, it's just, that's it, right? But what I learned is that there's a whole range of how you can not do something where you're just trying to sit and not do something and it's also you know really really hard and there are these different divisions there mm -hmm. so yeah yeah but anyhow so we talk about zen at least we begin about zen and we'll see wherever it flows i wherever like the point yeah <laughs> wherever it takes us uh so the first question is really simple what is zen and i mean how how would you how do you even explain this to people ah uh, yes yeah. Well, Zen is a word that has a, a lot of meanings. So uh, its original meaning is, means like a deep meditation state, a uh, state of being in deep meditation. But then it also is associated with a particular school of Buddhism. So it means like a, a sect of Buddhism. That's one of its meanings. Um, and then uh, we could say, you know, people will, the, millions of people have found different ways to say, what is Zen? You know, directly engaging in life with your whole heart right now, doing what you're doing completely right now, or um, uh, seeing through all dualities, you know, so people will approach it in many ways, but it's a way of life <clears throat> that's based in an awareness of interconnection and a commitment to the alleviation of suffering for everyone forever, to me. Right. <laughs> so those essentially those are the three three meanings that you could you could put into the word. Well, there's a lot. I mean, it's uh, it, it allows room for people to put a lot of different meanings on it. But uh, but you know, it's a it's a way of practice that's for alleviating suffering. It's based in moment to moment connection. Right. So if if someone out there is I guess aching to on helping the world mm. so people who practice Zen have a belief or have a, have a knowledge that that may be the best way of going about doing that would you, would you say that's the well I uh, I would not say I or anyone knows the best way because I, I don't think I can know that but I what well, I do think Zen has proven to be um, participating in the tradition of Zen and the practice of Zen has been a way of honoring my uh, impulse to alleviate suffering or to help people. Now, other people do it a lot of different ways. So I don't know if Zen's the best, but it's a way that really um, s seems true to me and seems true to many people that I know. So, uh, you know, there's an old expression, what's the best kind of exercise? The answer is the kind that you will do. Yes. So the same thing is true. I mean, if you're, uh, your way of alleviating suffering is being a doctor, that's cool. And if it's being a Christian, that's cool. And if it's being an atheist, that's cool. And finally, it's we, we individually get to work our way out. But Zen is a beautiful tradition to support people who want to do this. And if it, if it resonates with you, it can be very powerful in helping right. you do it. So in essence, uh, whatever way one may choose, it has to be something that speaks to their heart, right? It's just, you really have to yeah. resonate with it. I think so, I think so. Yeah. So uh, on this note, what do you think, I mean, 
maybe you give us a little bit of a background of how you came to Zen and what what in you resonated with Zen that made you choose this this particular path instead of I don't know maybe yoga or tai chi or whatever else. I mean, there are a lot of things out there. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, and I I do a number of them. You know, I do quite a bit of yoga, uh, in particular, but. Um, well, you know, I came to Zen just because I personally was experiencing a lot of suffering. Just I was angry and depressive and I had a lot of shame and it was just unpleasant. And so I was just looking for ways to be well. And also I knew that I wanted to, to contribute to the world. And I knew that my being so upset was making it so I couldn't do as much as I wanted to. So I looked at many different ways and I personally have used a lot of different ways. So. For one thing, I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic, so mm -hmm. I worked in recovering communities, and I've gone to a lot of Western psychologists, and that was awesome. I do I mean, a lot you, of, you mean without, it's not a facetious expression, right? You no. Know, awesome, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, great. Powerfully transformative. I do a lot of yoga and exercise, try to connect with my family, but it, within the process of just being like, I want to be well, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. um, doing all these different things one of the things that i kept hearing from people was like oh meditation is good mm -hmm. well, that was interesting and then i also at the same time was like well religion has been a major force for for helping people to be well or some people will argue that but you know a lot of people have said it really helped me be well and be of service so i was curious so i you know i read the bible and i, I read a bunch of the quran and i read a bunch of buddhist stuff and and some Hindu stuff, and uh, what happened was the stuff about Zen just seemed true to me. And that brought me in the door. And so what I can say about what seemed true to me was it did not uh, require believing in anything in particular. Mm -hmm. That was maybe at the bottom of what made you go, oh, this seems right. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to believe anything. And then it just showed ways of understanding the world that were based on interdependence, realizing that we're not ultimately separate, we're all ultimately connected, which I just felt was true. And uh, and was like, rather than, you know, someone out there is gonna save you, this is about you having an opportunity to do something beneficial. Right. So those things really spoke to me. And so then I just, you know, came to this place where we're sitting in to mm -hmm. meditate and uh, I actually thought, oh, there's a lot of Japanese ritual involved. I thought it was very weird. At, at, right? Sure. Yeah, right away I was like, this is really weird. But in between, there would be just meditation. We'd just sit silently for a half an hour, and it was like I felt the peace of that. Mm -hmm. uh, felt peace. And then I started coming and listening to uh, Tim Burton, with whom we just had an interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way he was teaching just it was like, yeah, I feel supported by this. This, this guy's talking about how to live in a way that I, I have some trust in. Maybe, maybe somehow deep inside you wanted to live, or at least yeah. have a bit of that way. Is, yes, yes, sure. Exactly. So there was like a meeting, and then that meeting allows for me to refine and develop how I want to articulate this life of, of wellness. Right. And then I guess, you know, how many years ago was that? That was about 15 years ago. So, as they say, the rest is history. Right? <laughs> now, now you're writing books about Zen. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, uh, Ben has two books out there now. Mm -hmm. The first one I have read, and the second one, maybe you could uh, tell us, you know, a bit about each one, just, you know, so people know, maybe they can look it up. We'll link some Amazon links to the description of the video. Cool, yeah. So, the first book is called Inside the Grass Hut, and the second one is called Inside Vasubandhu's Yoga Chara. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and whenever people hear that second title, they go, what? I've never heard of that. Right, right. So the first book is more accessible. Um, it is more probably directed towards a more general audience. So if you're kind of new to Zen or Buddhism, that, it, a lot of people find it like a really nice entrance point. Um, but uh, in the second book is more for people who are already involved in studying and practicing Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, they're both uh, based on ancient poems. So the first one's based on a Chinese poem called Song of the Grassroot Hermitage, which is really just a, a very personal expression from this monk from 1200 years ago named Shirtou, who just talks about 
um, living an extremely simple life with very little material support mm -hmm. and feeling a profound sense of connection to everything and deep abiding peace, mm -hmm. which sounds appealing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the second book is basically about a, a system of psychology. A lot of Buddhism is psychological, and uh, this <clears throat> body of teaching I'm talking about is almost all psychological. And it's really about how we can transform the way we experience and engage in the world from the very bottom of how our consciousness functions using meditative processes. Okay, so that, that would be the second book, and clearly that's the, I guess, a more advanced one, so to speak. Yeah, well, it would be less introductory seeming to most people, yeah. Right. And uh, you give me so many different things that I want to <laughs> ask you about. So I was, I'm, I'm struggling to just remember all these, all these, you know, hooks that I want to come back to. Yeah. But... You know, since we mentioned this a little earlier, you say, you know, you've tried all these different practices, but Zen is something that you resonated with. Mm -hmm. And would you say Zen, is Zen a religion uh, in the traditional sense? And, I, you know, this may be, I don't know if it's a provocative question or just maybe something that gets asked all the time. If it is, why? And if it isn't also, you know, what, what makes it different or how would you... Where would you put it in this landscape of everything that's out there? I like the way you phrase that question, where would you put it in the landscape? Because it is a question that comes up a lot. And I think that's kind of okay. I think it's actually funny. So, um, one, Zen exists as a part of Buddhism. And Buddhism itself could be thought to be either religion, either a religion or not a religion. Both can be reasonably, certainly can be reasonably argued. Um, and then, having said that, s some people practice Buddhism in a way that would be more traditionally understood to be religious, and some less so. Mm -hmm. So, if I say one of the principal things that makes people, and including me, make this distinction is, uh, Buddhism technically doesn't have any deity. Yes. So, according to many definitions of religion, then it can't be. However, it has everything else you'd expect a religion to have. It has all these ritual forms, yeah. it has clergy, the it, has, it has vestments, yeah. uh, you know, and, and on and on. So, like, there are many things that I do that look religious. So, on Tuesday and Thursday morning, I come in for a service, I bow, I chant, I put my head on the floor, just like Muslims do five times a day, traditionally. Mm -hmm. It looks almost identical. Yes. So, but, I'm not praying to anything. All I'm doing is I'm, I'm giving myself to the activity bowing. So it looks totally religious, but you could say it isn't. Right. That's okay. Um, I think that's just fine. <laughs> now there are some people, many people in the world, uh, it's quite common for Buddhism to have basically made deities within it. So even though maybe the original ideas didn't have a deity, the traditions change. So there are some people for whom, I mean, I think you would really say the way they practice Buddhism is clearly religious. I would say the way I practice it is probably pretty minimally religious, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty common for the people in this practice community. But it's a very malleable tradition. And finally, I'm like, if the word religion freaks you out and you just come in the door, well, I won't use it. Right. Now, if the world religion feels, word feels very supportive, maybe I will. Right. Now, if you've been around for a long time and the word religion still freaks you out, I'm going to use it. Right. So you can learn to work through whatever that issue you have is with religion. Right. So you purposefully invoke that emotion <laughs> just to let someone. So you can grow. Yes, yes, yes. But at first, you want to, you know, it's just like what we're doing here is, is we're making peace with our own bodies now. Right. You know, I have a, I have a story actually that, that, that shows this dichotomy even mm. with Buddhism. When I was in the university, I had a classmate from the country called Burma. Mm -hmm. yeah. Burma is one of those countries, if, if, uh, if not, not everyone knows, that practices the southern version of Buddhism that's actually very religious, where they consider Buddha a deity, right? Mm. And I was having some discussions with this classmate, that was already after my time here at the Zen Center, and I was telling him how, you know, how cool Buddhism <laughs> is, to which, you know, he was trying to tell me that he wants nothing to do with it because oh. it's a bunch of religious stuff and he's trying to be a scientist here, right? So you could just see that dichotomy. Yeah. You know, we were doing the same thing, but I, 
you know, I was approaching it more from the Zen point of view, and he was, he remembered what he saw in his country, and we were fighting heads like this, you know, about the same, the same exact topic. Yeah. yeah. No, well, Christianity is the same way. If you think about, like, Unitarians in the United States, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know much about them, but there's barely an idea of a God within that huge Christian religious community. And then go to the extreme of, of Earth, I don't know, by extreme, but you have Catholics and you have evangelical Christians. Right. And, you know, there's very, very different views. And then if you go into other countries, uh, you know, there are places where there are Catholic churches where uh, in South America where it's been fused with the Native American religions. Mm -hmm. So there are chapels where there'll be like a Christ figure with corn all over it. And they're right. like, this is the corn deity. Right. You pay, pay, pray to this guy to bring corn. Right. So human beings turn their cult, you know, culture changes and is dynamic. So it, Buddhism is very similar to Christianity in that regard. Right. So in, in your view, I guess in your view and in Zen's view, who was Buddha? Was he, was he a deity or was he just a smart guy? I mean, what, <laughs> what, what do you think is his story? Well, uh, ultimately, I think I can't know. Um, but... So there's kind of a couple ways of thinking about it. But the way I usually talk about it is there probably was a person. So there's a lot of stories about this person. And because they you know, weren't written down until 500 years after his death, we can't ultimately know how accurate they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's already true that even someone in your family, <laughs> right, when right. you hear a story, you don't know. So, But there probably was a person. And the person probably did uh, give some teachings that are like the ones that are attributed to him. I think. That's just my assumption of the way I like to talk. So, to me, it's just a person. Uh, and that's a pretty common view, but not everyone's. But here's the interesting thing. He was a person who was really committed to uh, dealing with the problem of human suffering. And at some point in his life, according to the stories, he's like, I figured it out. I have a solution, and I've resolved this problem with myself. I don't have any more suffering and satisfaction. So then he lived a life of love and service. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. But according to the teachings that we ascribe to, which aren't ultimately true, but I think are helpful, the reason that he transcended his suffering or was able to have this life free of suffering and of peace was he realized the totality of his connection to everything else. So he realized there was no separateness between him and everything else. Mm -hmm. What that means is, if we want to use like a mathematical principle, if he's not separate from anything else, you're a Buddha, and so are you. Right. Because you can't, what he realized was his not separateness. What made him Buddha was that realization of not separateness, mm -hmm. which means everything is Buddha, which sounds very religious. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a deity, it's just not separateness is Buddha. Connection. Right. So when you hear, when someone hears Buddha, they should hear the connection or the, the unity, right? So, so, yeah, it's yeah. not quite unity because it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. So it's not like everything is just one. It's everything is in a constant state of interconnected flux. Right. Transformation. Things exchange or whatever, you yeah. know, however we, we want to imagine it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you, you mentioned the, the mathematical way of putting it. Uh, recently someone asked me, what is the... What is the, the first and most important thing they should know about mathematics? And of course, you hear you know about axioms, and you know there are these different people offering different answers. And my answer was that the first thing you should know about mathematics is it uses this dichotomous way of thinking. And <laughs> an example I used, I said if you start with the most basic thing in mathematics, which is what you can call it a set, right? right? A set of something, of some objects. Just the sheer fact of the existence of a set already implies that something can be in the set or outside of the set. Just, just you don't have to say anything, but just the fact that you bring this set into existence, you've already implied all these other things. And essentially, from that very same basic principle, you can shake out, like from a box, you know, the rest of the mathematics and the logical thinking, right? Because mm, yeah. that, that, you know, and of course. Uh, Zen and Buddhism tries to do the very opposite, yeah. right? So, I mean, do you care to talk about? Is is there is there a lot to talk about there? Or well, I, I love I love the way you put it. You know, looking, 
continually looking underneath the most basic assumptions is powerful and effective. And you know, it's, it's part of Western philosophy, but it's also part of the Zen tradition for sure. And you, you put it well, a uh, really central idea of Zen and actually all other, there's a whole affiliated set of types of Buddhism called Mahayana. And they emphasize seeing through dualities or dualistic thinking. Mm -hmm. So they point out that we are constantly, unconsciously making duality unbelievably rapidly. So duality, I, I feel like we're separate beings. Right. Because we probably think we right. exist separate from each other. Well, that's okay, but it's not an ultimate truth. Right. We're but, also but, simultaneously right. just together. Yes. You know, we're breathing the same air. We're there's probably radiation flying across here. So yeah. there, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that seems to go unnoticed or even unthought of, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when you speak, it affect. I mean, it's instantly part of who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, and vice versa. So what I'm thinking is entirely dependent on what you're saying or just said, and also the fact my awareness that you're watching this. Right. So we are co-creating this. Right. And I mean, even when you say something or I say something, say that can invoke certain emotions within me. And that literally changes the state of my body or the hormones of the whole biochemical makeup and vice versa. I could say mm -hmm. something, you know, to make you angry or, you know, you can say something to make me laugh, right? That changes everything. Yeah. So, and the question is then, you know, where is you and where is I? Because clearly this one entity is affecting the other. Well, usually you can only affect something that's part of you, or at least, you know, that's how you can proceed with the logical brain, right? Yeah. Yeah, in a way, it's like, it's useful to see, I mean, all the dualities we use are helpful. I mean, math is helpful, mm -hmm. and uh, and realizing that I'm here is helpful, because, you know, if I want to take a drink, otherwise I might, like, throw it over my shoulder, right. and realizing my mouth is here. Right. But, what we're missing, what we're missing is how totally we're and the thing is, religious, this is why Zen might look like a religion, is all religions are talking about this ability to realize we're connected to something huge. Mm -hmm. Now, most of them would say it's like outside of you, so like there's some huge God that's out there and you can think of this touch. Mm -hmm. But the mystic traditions of all the monotheistic religions and Buddhism say you already are it. And you can realize that. And when you realize that, you feel uh, a piece and you feel a connection and then the way you act changes because you meet people and you're like, I'm connected to you. And you know, when you do something you realize that act is connected to people all over the world, animals and plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, you know, this, um, I guess well, I'm trying to switch gears a little bit here <laughs> and, uh, Meditation. So if Zen is meditation, that's that's one of the ways of looking at it. How does it help? You know, what what is so magical or special about you know the 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 simple act of sitting down, kind of like we're sitting now, and just breathing or watching your breath? I mean, a lot of you know intelligent people have done it over the last two thousand years or something, right? So there's got to be something about it. How can you? How can you explain this to someone who is completely new? Like, what's the? It seems to be a lot of beginners want to know the more of a practical value. What can be? What kind of benefit can they get out of out of this practice? Yeah, yeah. I, got, I just want to. I just want to play with your words. A lot of people who probably weren't very intelligent did it, and they were cool too. But uh, anyway, um, I might be one of them. We won't name it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so one thing is in our tradition, we want to, I will talk about the benefits of it and you know, there's all this science about it, so that's cool. But, um, in our tradition, we want to de-emphasize the idea that we're going to use meditation to get somewhere else. And so we're really going to want to emphasize a meditation that's just about being here. Because we're going to say the fundamental problem that causes so much of our suffering is this desire to get out of our lives. Mm -hmm. Or like, uh, to maybe be too trite, but uh, John Lennon said, life is what happens when you're making other plans. 
So he points out something about how we are, how we miss some opportunity to engage in life that's always available. So on the one hand, I want to just, before I answer that question with some ideas that make Zen look like a, or a meditation, look like an instrumental method, and just say the practice of meditation is about just being in life now, which isn't a passive thing. Mm -hmm. Actually, people are like, well, this looks very passive, but I'm very engaged if I'm sitting in meditation with everything that's happening. Mm -hmm. I may not be moving, but I'm pouring myself into life. And that, so the thing is, when I do that, then to make it start to look like what is the improvement that happens, right. uh, then I begin to be able to carry that into other activities. So when I'm talking to somebody, I'm more able to pour myself into this interaction mm -hmm. and not be sitting here thinking, what am I going to do next? You know, which when you're being interviewed, you're more likely to pay attention. But you know, you might sit down with your wife, and if she's talking to you, and you're thinking, what am I going to do next? And then there's no connection. So it's an activity of pouring yourself into connection, and this can be true in conversations and it can be true in acts. Like we were talking earlier, we were talking about working and how it felt good and you felt very concentrated while you were working mm -hmm. on something. When we work on something, we're like doing one thing and thinking about something else, it feels alienating. We're not connected to the act, we're not connected to our life. And so the practice of meditation can allow us to bring our capacity to do what we're doing now with our whole selves. And that it both feels good, generally, or feels better than doing the other one, and it, we do the things we're doing more completely, so there's more connection felt. So I can say that, but there's, uh, we'll say one other couple of things, which is another important component of this is um, we, if you practice meditation, you'll have feelings come up. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to be like, oh, I have a feeling. And now it's gone. And you don't have to get rid of feelings. You don't have to repress them. You don't have to make them happen. You just go, there's a feeling here, mm -hmm. and now it's gone. And you realize when you have feelings, you don't have to act impulsively. You can just let the feeling be and be there for it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you can be like, oh, I don't have to freak out when I have strong feelings because I can just sit here. Mm -hmm. And then that reduces our impulsivity. And for reasons that get a little complicated, it reduces the tendency to feel painful or unpleasant emotions that drive us to do things that are not so great. Yeah, so, this, this impulsivity, at least, well, in my life, it, it's caused me a, a good deal of trouble. Me because, too. You know, in, in relationships with people, mm -hmm. you say things that you later regret, yeah. and, you know, you might do, I mean, things that you wish, you know, you didn't do. Mm -hmm. Nothing too horrible or terrible, yeah. but, you know, it could have been a lot smoother or easier if you didn't do them. Right? Oh, me too. Yes. Many times. Like, including this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're right. So this ever since I started the the practice of meditation, I noticed that the well, if if we want to call them benefits, you know, some of the benefits I noticed is in particular it helps you. It helped me drop a lot of the you know habits that were not I, I consider them that were not so beneficial to my life. Mm. For instance, I dropped coffee pretty much on the spot after one morning. I was drinking it mindfully and I asked myself, why am I drinking this thing? In other words, it's like I woke up for the first time and I saw myself drink this and I asked, you know, did I choose to drink this? Mm -hmm. Or did society did just by some conditioning press it upon me that it's the thing you're supposed to drink in the morning? Yeah. And literally as soon as I realized that the next day I was done with coffee. So wow. you know, it's so it could it could be as powerful as even you know I, I don't know if you can cigarettes probably harder right because there's an actual addiction with coffee there is also but um, you know that's that's what I was able to do and uh, just in conversations with people like you mentioned when I hear someone talking someone speaking to me now I'm a lot less likely to just let my mind run and think oh you know that's the next thing I want to say mm -hmm. so I actually listen to what they have to say and. What I learned is that the responses I then give, give are so much more insightful and deeper mm. because I actually listened to what they said and I kind of lived the, the thought they were expressing. So what I come back with after that, if I come back with anything, maybe I can just say like, okay, that, that was good, right? You don't have to say anything, yeah, something to, to whatever someone says to you. 
Yeah. So, yeah, no, that that's that's quite good. So I, I would just love to yeah. say, I really think you hit on a good point: is that meditation allows you to live a more intentional life. So you're talking about like, really, what what is this? What am I doing? So right. we we sit here and we go, what even is this? Mm -hmm. You know, like you were talking about diving under those assumptions mm -hmm. of math. What what is this? And then we can, you know, instead of acting out of habits, we act out of our more deep intentions. Or what the guy who founded, uh, Katagiri Roshi, who founded this practice place called Our Inmost Request. So that's a beautiful thing about meditation that you, you hit on. Put so, so the inmost request is yeah. the, so that's that's the center core of, of everything. Is, is that how you describe it? Well, it's, it's, it's a personal thing. It's like your values is in manifest. And you know, a lot of times we're not really acting on our values. We're just kind of, I got to get to this thing, and I got to get to that thing, mm -hmm. and I got to. And if we stop, and what really matters to me? We're like, oh, uh, I think um, being happy and, and connecting with people. You know, so you kind of tap into that, and all the habitual things you're doing start to, can start to fall away, and you start to make a life that's built out of this more deep intentionality. Right. So, it, but it's different for people. It's not like there's one thing of it. But I point to this part of the body because I feel it personally. Right here. Yeah, sure. Sure. Oh. Yeah. No, that that makes sense. But you know this uh, about these the idea about these assumptions and questioning these assumptions. Mm -hmm. It actually, when you the moment you question one, at least for me, that's the way it was. You realize. If they if they were if they were able to fool me with say drinking coffee, which is kind of important, it's a stuff you put in your body. It's literally it's a direct connection to you. Yeah. What else did they fool me with? Because that's that's the question you start asking, and all of a sudden you realize there is this whole onion to peel, and you can peel these assumptions layer by layer, mm -hmm. and you don't even know where it goes or what's in the middle. You know, you just you know that this stuff that's falling off is not real. You you know there is something is much deeper inside. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's why one of the reasons people often resist meditation. They like the idea, but then they don't do it. And they go, why am I not doing it? Mm. There's a lot of reasons, but one I think you hit on, it's a little bit scary. Because like you said, I don't know, when you start peeling it, you don't know what's going to happen. So our mind is going, I, I want to be in control of what's going to happen. Right. When you meditate, you're actually opening up to something new, and that's a little scary. Right, right. So we, that's why it's good to have some people to meditate with to support you. And go, it's okay. It'll be all right. Right. Yeah. You know, I see this scare. So I come from the raw vegan, raw food community. Oh. So actually, I've been practicing this for two years now. Mm. And what I notice is a similar thing happens there when people try to switch to raw food. Which, of course, if you, know, if you imagine eating salads instead of very, I don't know, flavorful steaks, it, they are not as stimulating. Right, mm -hmm. the raw food is not as stimulating. It's, it's a, I wouldn't call it blander, but you can you can make taste there, but it's it's not as stimulating. So when people switch, their body or their just emotional side finds that it's not being you know stimulated as much, mm -hmm. and a lot of people actually slip and they go away from this diet precisely not because of the physical uh, parts or anything, but because their emotions are not being triggered the same way. Because yeah. food is something comforting we use mm -hmm. too. So it, it's in the same way as you can, if you, as you sit in meditation, you start exposing all these things where you can't just go do something or mindlessly turn on music and just like let it, let it flow and cover everything, fill the holes, right? Right. You just sit there and you have to face it. So the same, the same way with food, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think that's true. Although uh, I drink a lot of coffee, <laughs> right. well, that's fine. And you know, if you do it, you know, if you do it consciously, there is no problem with that whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I haven't thought about it, but uh, but yeah, food is is deep, and actually engaging with food with this, you know, the word that uh, comes to mind is mindfulness, which is you know related to meditation. It's paying attention to what you're doing in the moment, and actually does include thinking about it in terms of its context. So eating mindfully and being like, okay, what's this experience of eating like? And then one of the fun things about that is if you really pay attention with your whole being to eating, it's always amazing. I've eaten like white rice during the middle of a long meditation retreat where my mind is very focused and it's like, this is the best food I've ever had in my whole life. Yes. <laughs> but the other thing is, I mean, who knows the various reasons for uh, not eating meat, but 
<clears throat> you know, just realizing you know, that having said mindfulness about the impact of meat eating on our environment and on right. the cow or whatever. Or, or, or just ask yourself, yeah. because a lot of people, see, to me, just asking the question, where does this steak or whatever meat come from? Or what, literally, what needs to happen for this to be on my plate? Yeah. And then if you unravel that chain, you go back to, I don't know, some slaughterhouse, and you know, it's not a, it's not a very pretty picture. And of course, most people never get to, to asking themselves that question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but food is very culturally powerful. Uh, so, you know, there's probably people watching this who are like, oh, I thought I liked these guys, but now I'm talking about, you know, it's right. like, well, so now it's amazing right. how activating it is. And uh, I just see that in many, many ways. So I'm not here to, to preach, but it is worth uh, just with every aspect of your life, looking at how things are connected. Right, right. And, you know, not just thinking of things as like, I'm getting this for me, but how the whole system that supports that. Right. So... Having talked about that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to kind of get back to it, Zen, even though we've been, we've been, you know, bouncing around right. a little bit. So it seems to me that in every tradition of any kind, you know, be it a raw vegan movement, be it, you know, Christianity, be it whatever, there is a core set of beliefs or just understandings that accompany that teaching or that philosophical something, mm -hmm. right? What would you say? those are for Zen. You know, if you if you are practicing Zen Buddhist, what are the things that you are subscribing to, or at least you know you're expected to subscribe to, right? Because mm -hmm. there there's some underlying thing that everything is based on. Yeah. Yeah, it's a cool a cool question. I would say there generally isn't something that you're expected to subscribe to. Mm -hmm. Going back to one of the reasons why I came to the tradition, I was like, I, there's no like ideology you have to buy. However, there are some basic uh, ideas that underpin the tradition that most people are going to resonate with. So one is that um, Buddhism and Zen, that Zen being a type of Buddhism, is, is about alleviating suffering. So saving people from suffering or freeing people from suffering. And then uh, I'm just going to basically sum up one of the most central teachings of the tradition, which is called the Four Noble Truths. Basically it says there's suffering in the world and you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. You are empowered to do something beneficial. And then maybe the last piece I would say to that is where your power lies is all in how you view the world, how you act in the world, and how you uh, practice meditation. So it's never about manipulating things outside yourself. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you don't act. And that, so that sounds a little bit paradoxical so how can I explain it so the difference if, if you just focus on acting for alleviating suffering it's different than trying to control something else so the simple way this to express this is if you when it comes to voting now you can go and commit the act of voting mm -hmm. and then you voted and you're done you go do something else that right. is beneficial but what I and most people I know do is we vote and if the person we voted for wins, we go, yay! And then for four years, we jump around and go, ah, yay! Right. If the person we don't like loses, we spend a lot of time going, Ugh. So we were focused on controlling the outcome, which is absurd. Right. It's absurd. Right. So the thing is, if it's just like, if I can just vote, and then I turn around and I do something else that's hopefully helpful, and I turn around and do something else that's hopefully helpful, I'm free from all the pain of all these things that are clearly actually outside of my control that I pretend that I can control. Right. So you can alleviate suffering, and the focus is on uh, how you view things, which is in part seeing that they're not in your control. You have your power here. So focusing on how you view things, how you act. That includes make your living, speak, what you consume, and then meditate. How you meditate and meditation has you know been fundamental to the tradition for a long time because it transforms how we see the world and how we act right right and i mean of course on top of that the how you choose which acts to perform is clearly dependent on how conscious or how mindful you are because if you are mindful you will choose different acts of help trying to help other people mm -hmm. right so maybe i mean if, you, if we go back to the example of food if you're 
you just want to help, maybe you just, you know, feed people. If you're conscious and mindful, maybe you will feed them, I don't know, something without animal products or something, because that in turn causes more suffering, right? So mm -hmm. you're able to unravel these things that are a lot deeper. And so. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's just a constantly unfolding process. So one of the things I like about it, it's not about like, here's the answers, you just do this. And right. Do it. I mean, there are some practices that are encouraged and supported. But finally, it's a life of, uh, uh, a way of engaging with the dynamism of life, moment to moment, and really saying, what what is in my heart? How can I enact that for the alleviation of suffering? And then just ask that question again and again. Right. Right, right, sure. Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to ask you this question, and this might seem like a bit of a softball, but may, maybe not. We'll see. So yes. So prepare your bat. And there, there are these words that are traditionally associated with Buddhism that have taken root in the popular culture in one way or the other. Zen being one of them, by the way, yeah. which we discussed earlier. You know, now, nowadays there are companies named with like Many. Zen Desk and I mean, we're not advertising here, we're just whatever <laughs> came to mind, you know, people name books and there's usually a Zen and the art of, you know, put the word there at the end, you know, and so things like karma, dharma, uh, satori, which is enlightenment, right? Uh, and I'm sure I'm missing something, but could, could we go through those a little bit and just give, you know, maybe mm -hmm. the proper meanings of what, what they really mean mm -hmm. to, to clear out the, the popular culture? Well, yeah, karma is an activating one. Right. Well, karma means really different things to different people. That's kind of like we were talking about the variety of types of Buddhism, Christianity. Karma actually means really, really different things to different people even within Buddhism, and it's also a central concept of many other Indian-based worldviews. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I will say, I will, I'm gonna just talk about how I teach it and how I feel like this is well supported by the ancient Buddhist literature. Karma basically means um, uh, emotional, cognitive, and intentional habits. Mm -hmm or you could say emotional, cognitive, and intentional conditioning. So we have, and it comes through culture, it comes through biology, because um, you know, different kind of uh, animals have different behavioral habits, you know, so do humans, right. Right. So there's biological, familial, cultural, personal, so there's this huge, I mean, unbelievably immense body of conditioning that forms our way of having emotions, uh, intending to do things, and thinking about things. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, we are participants in the system. So this system is really, really, really big. You know, I mean, just uh, the number of concepts that have come into our consciousness through the languages we learn is insane. Yes, you know, like hundreds of thousands of words, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then we have our emotional habits, and everybody's different. So there's a huge power to all this conditioning that creates tendencies. And you can just see, like, why are all these people in this country are hate the people in that country? Right, right. You can say that's karma. They have a lot of conditioning that proves that. Um, but we're participants because in every moment, and this is why, this is what's, I think, most revolutionary about Buddhism, it emphasizes that we're participants in the process of karma because in every single moment, we engage in intentional, emotional, and cognitive acts. Mm -hmm. And so when we do that, we are putting something into that system of conditioning. Mm -hmm. So the question comes down to, moment to moment, what are we putting into this vast ocean of conditioning, much of which creates human suffering and suffering for other species? Right. What are we putting in? Can this be a moment where what I put in is compassionate awareness instead of like trying to control or grasp? Right. Uh, so, so I would say that's basically what karma is about. So there are people that say like, oh, if you have bad karma, you'll be born in another life with bad stuff. That's a stone or something. Or, you know. I don't know anything about that. Right. I just haven't got any experience with it. But the idea that um, we're conditioned just resonates with my direct experience. And the fact that I can transform uh, the way I experience
experience the world, my emotional reactivities, my mm -hmm. intentional tendencies is very clear to me because it's happened. And I can see how that happens culturally too mm -hmm. with a group of people. Right. And after that, whether you know you were reborn again as a superhero or some sick individual, so be it, right? That, yeah, uh, I'll find that out later. <laughs> right, right. So why why worry about it? Yeah, that's my attitude. Sure, sure. Well what about what about things like there's there's also Dharma, which which is I guess slightly less less known. And yeah, well Dharma is basically a word with a couple different meanings that are totally different. So we usually say big D Dharma, Dharma with a capital D, mm -hmm. basically means uh, Buddhist teaching. To uh, to people from other religious traditions it would also mean teaching, but within Buddhism it means like teaching. Mm -hmm. So like Sometimes people will say truth, but that's not. I, I, don't, I don't know what the truth is, right. but I'm willing to teach right. uh, and be taught and learn. Um, small d dharma means uh, phenomena. So, like um, any phenomena is a dharma. So, a momentary uh, aspect of experience is called a dharma. So, like within this moment, there's like uh, I, I'm, you're here in my field of vision, and there's a cushion over there, and I know the camera is there. Right. So one is the capital D is the, the teaching or I guess the truth, right? That would be kind of used in that direction. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Dharma is a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Which I'm sure they're related because I guess the teaching is about the phenomenon, right? That happens. Yeah, there gets to be, if you really dig down into it, it's kind of amazing. There's this place where they meet, but I, I don't want to, it gets Pretty heavy. I'm sure. But you are correct. Right. right. Okay. So let's take a five minute break. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, the next question I really wanted to ask you, and I, I think these are the, to me at least, these are the types of the salient questions. Mm. The, the modern life, it's changed so much even in the last 20 years, yeah. right? It's in many ways, it's gotten out of control, right? Mm. Informational overload. Uh, life is getting faster, easier to get information, bombardment from every direction, right? So the instant messaging, the, you know, the radio, the music, you know, it's so easy to, to get a hold of something, so easy to distract yourself. So on one side, it seems that the relevance of Zen is increasing, right? So it, it'll help us really focus, kind of drop all of that off. But on the other hand, there is this idea that, okay, you know, maybe it's not so relevant because it's, you know, all these old fogies kind of thinking about stuff and, you know, thinking they know something. Like, what, what's, where's the balance there? And I mean, what, what, what's your take on that? Because you travel a lot, so you, you yeah. talk to people. I, I think there is uh, the growing, an enormously growing interest in meditation. Um, and Zen is basically part of that movement. So, I mean, every kind I teach is, meditation in more context than I ever would have imagined 10 years ago. Uh, uh, correctional facilities, halfway houses for people in recovery from addiction, police officers, psychic trained police officers, corporate environments, schools are doing it now. So people are realizing that there's something valuable about um, just being in life in a more simple way. Uh, and probably for a variety of reasons, but the part of it has to be a reaction to the, the intensity of the media input we're getting. Um, so personally, I, I do, I engage in, you know, I'm in social media and, you know, I, I listen to the radio sometimes, but, you know, a lot of times I just don't. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty good. You know, there's, there's something about the way the human mind is conditioned that, uh, when it's presented with the option of having a lot of media input, it tends to go, oh, I don't like that either. Right, right. I mean, we just know that feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we can, we do have intentionality. We can say, is this actually benefiting? So sometimes I'll be like, no, I just sat around poking around the internet for an hour and a half and it didn't do anything for me. Right. And then I'll be like, well, I'm gonna do something else. But I'll notice that even though I think that, there's like this impulse to just keep, you know, it's like a mouse in a mm -hmm. cage and wants to hit the same bar over and over mm -hmm. and get a little reward thing. 
Um, but we can develop our capacity to, to live more intentionally. And, you know, sometimes I poke around on the internet, it's great. I'm like, I'm learning, connecting with old friends, it's cool. Right, or read something, even yeah. about Zen. Or, yeah. yeah, sure, yeah, I'll research Zen on there, why not? So it's not about some kind of absolute things, but I think a lot of us can just feel that it, it just feels kind of fractured. And, and so it's nice to have a break. Right, so the Zen is, in this case, is the vehicle that provides, one of the vehicles that could provide that. Yeah, it's a culture that encourages us to step away from that. There's a whole culture of Zen that's you know, it's about doing simple things with your whole heart, you know, gardening, growing, right. Right. sitting still. Sure. Well, you know, another thing in our society that's uh, very much pervasive, especially in the Western society, and I think the United States is the originator of that idea, right? Capitalism, oh. the, the, the the money subject. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you reconcile the two? And do you even see a problem there at all? You know, where Zen is saying, okay, drop the attachment to things, right? Just be with yourself. Mm. And this idea of money. I mean, is there a contradiction there, or what, what, what's your take on that? Well, there there probably is some kind of contradiction. But what what I can say and what I I try and live and try and teach is to kind of go back to what we were saying earlier about investigating these assumptions. Um, most people that I know, including me, have some kind of underlying assumption that we got to get just a little more money. And that like we'll buy things and that's going to make us happier. So it's like, I'm going to get a new phone, mm -hmm. iPhone. I don't even know what it is. iPhone 12 right. at this point. Right. Anyway, it's like the new iPhone. That's going to be really cool. Or a new car right. or uh, a new piece of jewelry, whatever it is. So some part of us thinks that's going to be the satisfying thing. Mm -hmm. And that's connected to money, right? right. Well, money symbolizes security for us. Mm -hmm. um, but what I encourage is, is just questioning that with some intentionality. So it's not like, now you have to give up all your possessions. But just really look at, like, how satisfying was it? How fast did I go from being like, that new phone is going to be the solution to, that's going to be awesome right. to like complain about, it, right? Which is usually like forty-eight hours. Yes. <laughs> right. So it's about um, having a conscious engagement with that process of desiring to consume, consuming, and gaining new things, and and letting that conscious engagement transform you in however way it does. So it's not like about a rule you have to not have these or not have those or stop doing this. It's about a process of personal investigation. Mm -hmm. But I will say that, uh, you know, I think our culture is, is painfully and, and sadly materialistic and people suffer a lot because of it. Right. Both people who have a lot of material wealth who are not probably ultimately satisfied with, by it and people who are really brutalized by the system, you know, worldwide of uh, global capitalism. Right. Either being the cogs in these machines or just because their psyche is so conditioned, these things are so entrenched, you know, with the facts that, okay, I have to get my, I have to work, you know, I, I want, 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 and, you know, yeah. causes all kinds of unhappiness. Yeah, well, and yeah. the way the system works also, you know, people starving, you know, right. there's a lot of really harmful stuff that as a culture we could do a lot better supporting everybody if our focus changes. Right. So I can't make everyone change, but what I can do is I can work on that change here, and then I can participate in culture in a way that maybe moves things in a better way. Right. Well, so I want to I want to kind of bounce this idea off of you a little bit just to, to see what you think, because when I was asking myself these questions, these very questions, mm. you know, to me, it was also a bit of a contradiction, because if I had a certain skill or knowledge or know-how that I've acquired over, you know, over my life or some time, mm. and I knew how to use something or do something, and I, I always wanted to help people, but if I had to charge money or ask for something in return for these skills and knowledge, it didn't really sit very well with me uh, to to do that. So I, I, I was really um, having a bit of a, an issue on trying to resolve that. And so one way, I'm not saying this is the perfect answer, but one way I resolved it for myself is I told myself that this this the fact that i'm charging for this could act as a filter and what i mean is it could act as a filter for 
determining who is really serious about wanting to do what I'm about to teach them mm -hmm. versus who is just kind of kind of wants to know it and because it's available for free might as well you know check it out or something mm -hmm. does that make sense so, yes so if I'm to give an example from 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 the things I do if someone's asking me for help you know about raw food or this diet or how to improve their health the exercise you know the mm -hmm. the sport on the on the raw vegan diet um, and I do a consultation mm -hmm. right if there is from a certain point there is money involved for this very reason you know it's not even the amount that's important to me and it, it, in fact I mean I would even go as far as saying I would just never spend that money it just kind of sits there right a little bank account I mean it's not big yeah but this this very fact that a person gives me something shows me that they're willing to learn already so it shows me the seriousness it opens up it's like a commitment yes yeah, yeah. and it, it, people they don't feel that commitment they'll be like oh i better pay i really want to do this right so now i give resources yeah, yeah. i have to get something back and they're really <laughs> trying to get stuff from me and what i'm giving them is the information the the certain so I, I, what, what do you think of this? I mean, is this? No, I think that's really true. You know, uh, some uh, do, meditation groups have done lots of different things, but one of the ones I do, or some of the ones I do, they're set up so you have to pay and sign up for a while. And I mean, one of the things is I need to eat. So that helps to support me, mm -hmm. which is a very valid reason to charge money for things. Um, but I think, I hope. Right. But, uh, uh, but the other thing is, if people sign up for the thing and pay for it, they go, oh, I'm going to do this. Right. It helps them make a commitment to do the thing that they want to do. Or like gym memberships do the same thing. Mm -hmm. that, that thing says, oh, no, I'm going to go actually do the exercise. And people struggle to exercise. So I think there is definitely um, some truth to that. Yeah. Right, right. So it's just uh, something I've discovered along the way because it was really quite a bit of a mm. trouble to me to, to answer this question for me because I thought they were mutually exclusive. But then I realized not so much you can actually work with this. Yeah. So, so back to your answer about the money is, so money itself is not the evil part, it's, it's what we, basically what we choose to do, how we choose to act and how we choose to approach the situations that money creates or magnifies. That's probably true. I, I haven't thought of it in those terms. But the thing is, I don't tend to think in big absolutes. So mm -hmm. practically speaking, I don't think money's going away real soon. Right. So I'm more interested in investigating what we're doing with money, how I engage with it, you know, than kind of thinking, oh, money is the root of all evil. I don't know, what, what am I gonna do with that information? Right. So in a plus evil, that's puts, you know, I don't want to get into the question of good and evil. I want to get into what's my choice? How can I actively engage in this complex system? And so just deciding an incredibly pervasive part of it is evil. It's hard to really engage with it at that point because I've just put it out. Right. Yeah. Right. And I mean, of course, in a lot of the Buddhism, there is this idea that, you know, nothing is really evil or good. It's just how we choose to, to look at it, right? Yeah, well, the, the, in some types of Buddhism, the language of good and evil comes up a lot. Uh, but in the forms that I think are more effective, the language is one of affliction or um, non-affliction or affliction or wellness. So the, the question isn't good and evil, but um, uh, wellness or non-wellness. So when we act, instead of being like, I'm going to conquer evil, or I'm going to promote good, or I'm going to be good, I was evil and now I'm good. Right. Moralistic language has a lot of downsides, I think. So the thing is, it's a language of healing. Mm -hmm. So Buddhism is essentially presented in its earliest teachings as a medicine for human suffering. And so the language is one that will, will go, oh, I did something really harmful. That was afflicting. It wasn't evil. Because then I can go, oh,